in his in <laughs> art is so successful because he had some clear ideas and ah. managed to write down very clearly the, the proposition he had. Yes, yes, cool. And so, kind of, and then that may be why he's controversial also because he's also he's been very clear in his positions. Yeah. He's also clear in sort of this distinction between oppressed and oppressor. And one last thought, Martin. And then here you have what I would call his not only pedagogy or life biography, but his philosophical approach to the world and what education means in the world. And so you have um, like this idea of the press and the worker and labor movements. Oppressed can become the oppressor. So that often happens. He talks about that. Um, and the politi politization of education. I would say that this is actually him discussing how all education is political. That's sort of his philosophy of education, right? Um, so those are sort of the knowledge we have right now. Uh, Martin, do you want to add something real quick? I, I would just say that he became very identified with the Workers' Party. And I think a lot of the, you know, I think he showed me that sign of people carrying in the street just recently. You know, enough with prayer, you know. And I think that has to do with very little has to do with this, but it has to do with he, he was very politically involved. So we'll add that to his life biography, is that he helped to found the PT when he came back from exile in 80. Can I just ask, um, what was his personality like? For those who actually knew him, I mean, what was his... Sweet. Sweet? I mean, the, yeah. 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 He was uh, soft, really... Uh, soft and sweet. He wasn't like a fierce person. But it... it, it Turned a little bit to this more populistic uh, character, you know. It's, uh, he was like an Indian guru. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. He was like an Indian guru, you know. He captivated, you know. He could mesmerize an audience because he would totally be able to make them feel that he was listening to what they said, was hearing what they said, and that he was responding to them. I think it was. It was not about him, really. It was quite amazing to watch. He did some lectures here at Stanford. He would sit and talk. It's, it's not that he was like all of all, you know? And very... <coughs> very yeah, he was His very, rhetoric yeah. was very good. He had a, he had a kind of a... Uh, he was like a very religious good. figure. He was very calm and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. So I think this conversation about what he, he's like is actually very important because I consider myself what, I sort of referenced myself before, a second generation Frarian scholar who never actually met Frary. Um, and so, just total honesty, uh, I never cared about education in my life, and I never, certainly never cared about Paulo Frary. Before, um, you know, when I was an undergrad, and before undergrad, I was always a community organizer, and I was involved in organizing, my parents were both labor organizers, and I was involved in various labor struggles in college and um, various attempts to organize. Basically, my parents had taught me that people are poor not because they're lazy, but because people are, are, are oppressing them or taking advantage of them. And so I've always been involved in organizing struggles. And when I was an undergrad, I read Pedagogy of the Press because I was like, oh, you got to read Pedagogy of the Press. And I read it, and I'm like, where is it? I'm like, what does this mean? How does that like, what is, means absolutely nothing to me. So I like threw it over my shoulder and didn't read it. And then when I was, um, but I was also frustrated with the US, US activism and US organizing because we felt so insular, like we were never growing and we'd only talk to ourselves. And so I was really searching for a method of social change that really would resonate with me. And when I was, um, when I was in college, my junior year, I went to Hesife, Pedro's, Pedro's city, which changed my life. And I began working with a feminist organization. And the goal of this feminist organization was to end all forms of classism, racism, and gender oppression. <laughs> and so I, Lorgis, who's the founder of this organization and my political mentor for the past uh, 15 years, I asked her, I was like, Lorgis, how are you possibly going to do that? And of course, she pointed to a picture. And what picture did she appoint to? Prairie. Prairie. <laughs> right? And I was like, Prairie? Really? Pedagogy of the oppressed? Like, I read that and it didn't resonate. But then I spent two months working with this feminist organization, and I actually saw Frary. Like, I didn't read Frary. I saw the way in which community organizations in Brazil were actually reinventing Frary and using Frary in practice as a method of social change. And so I would go and I watch this organization 
um, ha group together a bunch of elder women and they read the Human Rights Declaration and then they talk about what aspects of the Human Rights Declaration weren't be, were being respected in their community. And then they go out and they fight for garbage pickup and they, they use education as sort of a method of raising consciousness and change. And so what I always say is Frary the person, he might have been great and wonderful and charismatic, but for me Frary is not important. The reason why it's critical to understand Frary is because he has a, a material reality in the world in the sense that thousands of organizations globally are reinventing what he said and using it in practice. And so I really, um, I think in the US academia, there's somewhat of a Frary industry where people like to talk about Frary and read Frary and there's all these Frary books that sort of idolize him as the person. And if you take anything from this presentation, it's gonna be, it's not about Frary the person, it's about, it's about what he said resonated with local groups and they're actually reinventing him daily. And so that's sort of the main point I want to start with. Um, what I'm going to do is just for the next like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'm going to just put Frere into political, put him into his context and show why Frere was really a product of a very particular moment in Brazil. And then I'm going to tell you what I think what I take, like the nine things I take from Frere that I think are most important. And then we're going to open it up to discussion. Paula is going to comment and also have some questions for all of us to talk. So basically, <coughs> I'm going to talk about a little history and then my favorite take-home point from Frere in theory. Okay? Sound good? Yeah. Okay. So, good old Frere lived from 1921 to 1997. Um, and I think there's a few key things to understand about Frere. One is that he was living in a very radical moment. He was living in the 40s, 50s, 60s is really when he's writing and working with education. And this is a very revolutionary moment in Brazil. Brazil's on, on the brink of a socialist revolution, which is why a coup happens shortly afterwards, right? And so there's all this mobilization, all these people thinking about social change when Frere is writing. Another important thing to know is that Freire probably would never have been internationally renowned, except that exile, exile globalized him. So in 1964, when the military government of Brazil decided to exile Freire and lots of other left-leaning organizers and activists, basically that's when he became internationally renowned, because he was forced to leave the country for 15 years or 16 years, and then he really became known in Europe and the United States. He went to Harvard, Chile, and so it's really exile that globalized Frere. Um, some words you might sort of associate with Frere are things like problem posing, generative themes, the unfinishedness of human beings, and reading most probably most importantly, reading the word and the world. So the idea of literacy, not just being a process of learning how to read a certain word, but actually reading a world. Right? And so we'll talk about that more. And the other thing, I, this, you guys know this because you all speak Portuguese, but in English people don't realize that the word consciousness and consciousness raising, that word in, in Portuguese ends with action. Right. So the consciousness is a very bad translation into English because the point of conscientização is that it's both consciousness and action in the world. And so that's sort of another key point. And then again, I already mentioned this, Freire's legacy is really within grassroots movements. And so those are some sort of key points about Freire. I think it's more consciousness raising in so, English. But I still think that's a bad translation because it know. doesn't get into the action part of it, that really dialectic. Raising is action. So I think this has a, this does have emotion. This word has emotion, consciousness, that's not an the consciousness raising. So I guess this word is usually translated as consciousness raising. But usually I just articulate the fact that you can't just suddenly be ideologically superior than everyone and sitting on your rocking chair. You have to go and actually do something to be a prayer in, right? Um, and that's a critique of mostly left-leaning political people who talk the talk and don't organize at all. But anyway, so that, and then Frere critiques them also. So real quick about Freire, uh, he grew up in a middle class, um, middle class neighborhood in the poor northeastern city of Recife. Not so poor anymore, we know that it's changed since the 40s, but in the 40s it was very poor. Um, parents lost the job and it's always, it's sort of always referenced that Freire remembers uh, that, that he was, what it feels like to be hungry. And so he always says that he couldn't study, he couldn't concentrate in school when he was hungry. And so one of his first things he cared about um, later on with making sure that kids could eat as actually a, a way to make their cognitive abilities function. 
Um, Frary's not a product of the Hesifi public school system. He got a scholarship. His mom was really active, went out, got him a scholarship to a private university. And so he had a very elite education growing up. Um, in the 40s and 60s, the Catholic action movement was really big. And so do, raise your hand if you've heard of liberation theology. Not everyone knows what liberation theology is, but... <laughs> I won't explain it really. I'll just say liberation theology was a trend within the Catholic Church in the, in the 60s, that basic 40s, 50s, that basically were a bunch of priests that thought charity work was no longer sufficient for ending poverty. You had to make structural changes. And so the Catholic action movement was really about this preferential option for the poor. Furry got involved in that. He was very religious, very Catholic. He got radicalized, thinking, no, we can't just give poor money. We have to change the structures that keep people poor. Damel Rakamara in Hesife is a really famous bishop, very progressive. He was uh, Freire's mentor. And then Freire became the coordinator of an education and culture program directed towards workers. Um, and so, this is just some quotes, like throughout the 1950s and 60s, Brazil's political, social, and intellectual life was burgeoning, right? There's these peasant movements, like all over Hesife, all over Pernambuco, there's rural resistance, there's the Catholic Church and liberation theology. You have, it's so, so radical, you have JFK creating the Alliance for Progress to try to sort of improve conditions in Brazil in order to stop the more radical movements that are arising. And then finally, you have a very left-leaning uh, governor of Pernambuco, Miguel Hayes, who's famous for supporting the Pernambuco labor movement. And he actually makes Freire the director of a big educational division in the state of Pernambuco. Again, this would not have happened if it wasn't already a radical mo a moment for Freire. Freire is really famous for creating these cultural circles. So basically, um, his first literacy attempt was in a city called Angicos, also in Pernambuco, where he brought 300 sugarcane workers together, and he taught them how to read and write in, I think, less than a month or two months, or maybe it was three months. But in like several months, he was able to teach these sugarcane uh, workers to write. And the real, how he was able to do this is he would go, he would take literacy teams who would go into the community, and they would find generative themes. So what's a generative theme? A generative theme is a word that people use that they can learn to read and write, but that it will also generate other conversation. So for sugarcane workers, an obvious word that would be a gener generative theme would be sugar, azúcar. And so how do you spell azúcar? Azúcar, learn how to read it, learn how to write it, but then learn how to understand that word in context. Why is there sugar in Brazil? Why do we, why, why who, who grows the sugar? Why is it mostly black laborers who are growing the sugar? What's the history of slavery in Brazil? Why did slaves come over? Who owns the sugar plantations? Where is the sugar exported to? And so the idea is all these generative themes or these words, for adults, you learn how to read and write them, but you really just learn how to understand them in context. And that for, for adults, that's really just more exciting than learning A, B, C, D. It's more exciting to learn whole words rather than syllables. And so that's very famous literacy method. Um, so just left-leaning President Bollard, he's almost a populist, he comes to the presidency, and he actually invites Freire to run a national campaign that's taking the Anjico method and making it national. And so that year, this is a good quote from a book I like, Freire issued a call in Rio for 600 students to serve as literacy tutors. When 6,000 volunteers showed up, this is in the early 60s, the interviews had to be conducted in a soccer stadium. It was a time of fantastic popular mobilization, and education was part of it, right? And so this is the big point. 6,000 people wanted to help Freire. People were excited. He was really a product at this moment. Unfortunately, this national literacy campaign never happened because the military dictatorship overthrew the government, overthrew Bolar in 1964, and Freire was exiled, right? Um, where did he get exiled to? Does anyone know where he was exiled to? Chile. Paula. Uh. <laughs> yeah, Chile. What was happening in Chile in the mid-1960s? Salvador Allende. So he moves from this radical context in Brazil and he goes to Chile and there's another socialist president, Salvador Allende. And so, well, that was what he went earlier. 
Allende came later, yeah. And so Allende came later. Yeah, Allende was like yeah. He went in the 60s. Yeah. And, and before Allende, there was a, a Christian Marxist president. I'm forgetting his name now. No, not Christian Marxist. What? Was that a Frey? No, Frey. 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 Frey was not Marxist at all. Yeah. He wasn't Marxist. What? He was not Christian. Not at Democrat. all. No, he was center. Okay. Center no, but it was the, the, the point is, is that Freire goes to Chile. Chile is also this radical <coughs> moment. He is able to experiment with these cultural circles in the periphery of Chile. 1968, from Chile, he publishes Pedagogy of the Press. And so Pedagogy of the Press has to be understood as a product of the 50s and 60s in South America. By the way, there were many other Brazilian intellectuals from the left who also went to Chile. Was it uh, the famous... Uh, what? Yeah. Just Six, yeah. Yeah. people, yeah. but also famous political, you know, Marxist political scientists with uh, their mentioned yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So there's lots of Brazilian intellectuals who are exiled. Yeah. Was kind of, well. Yeah. I, was, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, Cardozo's dependency book was published uh, at the same time with the Chilean, in fact a year before, with the other Chilean uh, intellectual. Uh, yeah. I'll let them. Yeah. And go ahead, Bob. Well, I was just thinking that in the case of Chile, I think it was more because it was also oh, to, you know, it wasn't because it was a radical movement in Chile that attracted the Chile. It was because it was open to uh, people leaving Brazil to yeah. escape the military. Yeah, no, so that's a good point. The few democracies but it really yeah. happens to be. That's a great point. My only point is that Chile was a perfect context for him to continue experimenting with these cultural circles and experimenting with his pedagogy. Um, have to Russia. We don't know. So Chile was nearby. What? So he also, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip forward a little. So he also went to Geneva. He spent ten years working with this uh, World Council of uh, Churches in Geneva. From Geneva, he was able to really expand talks and books and, pra and practices pedagogy in various places. He was invited, for example, to Guinea-Bissau after the revolution there. But in the United States, it's actually very interesting because Ferry talks about how important he spent about two or three years in the US um, as a visiting professor in Harvard. Um, and this is another quote I like. The context that surrounded Ferry in the US was different than Chile, but it was equally intense. The late 1960s and early 1970s in the United States were characterized by deep social and racial conflicts, rising, rising social movements, and youth rebellion. And so you have Ferry really learning that periphery is not a geographical concept. It's not just that Brazil is in the periphery of the US, but actually within the US, you have racial and gender oppression, and you have periphery, you have sort of a third world within the first world. And so that was sort of profound for Freire. He also met Ivan Illich, who is famous for his writings on deep schooling, wrote articles for the Harvard Education Review, blah, blah, blah. OK, so he's exiled. He becomes famous in exile. Exile is the best thing that ever happened to Freire. And then he comes back. No, it was. For his theory, it was. Um, and then he comes back in 1980. Uh, in 1980, when he comes to Brazil, he participates in the founding of the Workers' Party. He has a short involvement in the state in Sao Paulo. Um, he continues writing uh, books for the rest of his life. He becomes a professor at Unicampi, as we well know. He gets, uh, anyway, marriage. He has a second marriage. You didn't put in a very important thing there. What? 1982, he came to Stanford. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I knew him from before. I wasn't at Stanford when I first made this presentation, so it wasn't my center at the university. Okay. But, uh, it was a really uh, a famous time. seminar. Yeah. Two weeks. By, by, you had to pay. So what I want to do, and if you want to read a good book, there's actually a pretty good book about Ferry's two years in Secretary of Education and the real big challenges he faced. Um, but what I want to do, because that's just sort of a history. And again, what's the take home point from the history? Excuse me, uh, just to remind uh, who was the governor? Uh, no, prefect. 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 Prefect.
No, his wife, wife was later on. Later yeah. on. But she became. They're very yeah, she became profile, right? yeah. But they were divorced. Yeah. They were so, divorced. Yes. I took it away. The big point so far: exile is great for people. But I think the point you made was that he was already very well known in Brazil uh, and this um, literacy movement in, uh, was then actually co-opted by the military and turned into an agency for a famous agency for what? Like Mobral, Mobral, and there was a big discussion about Mobral whether it it was just you know another mechanistic sort of uh, cop you know non-reformist reform etc. But he but Mobral was in a sense created for Prairie to do this, so he was already well known. So if you're going to go into exile, be well known already. <laughs> and then go into exile, and then you become very, even more influential because, after all, they were killing people in Brazil on the left, you know. Yeah. And it, it was not, it was not a fun time. Yeah, not a fun time. My 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 take home point. Those are all good points. My big take home point is just that there were thousands of people who were involved in political organizing at this time, and Freire became this famous sort of person we always look to, but it was really the thousands of people who were involved in politics and organizing that created the context for Freire to become famous. So the point is that it's not always about the person, it's about the context. Martin doesn't agree, because Martin's well, also Well, Lenin was in exile too, you know. <laughs> and you could say, oh, it was all those soldiers and workers, but the fact is that these people, I hate to say this, uh, leaders do make a difference because they crystallize uh, ideas around which people organize. And if you know from being in organizations, if you don't have a crystallizing ideology or crystallizing set of ideas, then everybody goes off on their own and does whatever they want. And every, there are lots of ideas out there, so you have to have some. Yeah, it's a very, it's, a, it's this relationship between good ideas and leadership and also certain moments. So if Freire was born in the 1890s uh, or the 1980s, it's unclear whether his ideas would have had such sort of resonated with so many people. Real quick, because I want us to discuss, I'm just going to give you what I think in a very bank deposit way. I'm going to deposit into your mind what I think are the nine most important things about Freire, OK? <laughs> and with each thing, I'm going to add a Freire quote just to get the sense of it. Um, the first thing I think is most important about Freire is his political philosophy that, he, that optimism, he thought that history was unfinished and therefore he was optimistic about every single person's ability to contribute to making history in the future. He said, in truth, it would be incomprehensible if the awareness that I have of my presence in the world were not simultaneously a sign of the impossibility of my absence from the construction of that presence. Insofar as I'm a conscious presence in the world, I cannot hope to escape my ethical responsibility or my action in the world. So in other words, we all are going to construct the world in the future. And as human beings, it's impossible not to be part of that construction. And so this idea of optimism due to unfinishedness. The other thing that I think is really important about Freire is he said that education is never neutral. It's always actively maintaining or changing the status quo. And so I really like this quote where he said, the defendants of the neutrality of literacy programs do not lie when they say that the clarification of reality at the same time of learning to read and write is a political act. This is Freire's pedagogy. They are wrong, however, when they deny that the way in which they deny reality has no political meaning. And so Freire, what Freire is really saying there is, yes, what I'm doing is overtly political. It's trying to use education as a method for people's construction of a new world, but education in all of its forms is political and has political implications when you deny people's ability to change that construction, right? So education is never neutral. It's sort of another important part. A third important point is, and this is the most famous point in, in teacher training classes, they usually um, assign the one chapter that Ferry talks about this, but um, it's bank deposit education, so the idea that um, uh, you can just take 
knowledge and deposit like a bank into someone's head. Like Puerto Rico now knows this, and so now he has this knowledge, and then it's this quantitative quantitative thing that just can be deposited. That's sort of a very known, very critique. His uh, solution to bank deposit education was he called problem posing education. So teaching is constructing knowledge and is dialogical, which is probably why he gets considered to be the voice of constructivism. I actually don't think he was like a, a constructivist in the sense that he didn't think prior knowledge was important. Furry thought it was very important for people to learn all of the knowledge that humankind has accumulated over time, but that we have to sort of dialogically understand that knowledge in relationship to people's experiences and in a relationship to political context. And so you gotta know it, but you gotta know it in relationship to what your life is like. Um, and then this is sort of a famous quote from Pedagogy of the Press. The students, no longer docile listeners, are now critical co-investigators in dialogue with the teacher. The teacher presents the material to the students for their consideration and reconsiders her early considerations as if students express their own. I'm going to come back to this because people sometimes misinterpret this quote to mean a teacher is just a facilitator, which is not true for Frere. Okay, might be true for Montessori, but not for Frere. The fourth most important point is this idea of reflection, action, reflection. So the point of education is to intervene in the world. That is the only point of learning is to be able to go and intervene. And so a good quote I like about this, when a word is deprived of its dimension of action, reflection automatically suffers as well and the word is changed into idle chatter, verbalism, into an alienating and alienating blah. On the other hand, if action is emphasized exclusively to the detriment of reflection, the word is converted into activism, action for action's sake. And so this is really Freire's idea is that you have to not just learn, not just be talked at, but actually take action. But you can't just, and then this is sort of Freire's critique of the Linsky model, you can't just take action and action and action, you have to reflect on it. I know we were talking about Alinsky yesterday. Anyway. So action and reflection. Um, uh, fifth, I think fifth or sixth, I'm not sure what I'm on. Um, the starting point, this is another thing Ferry is famous for, the starting point is people's knowledge and background. It's impossible to talk of respect for students, for the dignity that is the process of coming to be, for the identities that are in the process of construction, without taking into consideration the conditions in which they are living, their knowledge. To ridicule students' knowledge, it means that you're not a Frarian teacher. So people bring all this knowledge into the classroom with them, and you can't just ridicule it. Ridicule it. You have to problematize it. So if people come to classrooms with racist views, with sexist views, you don't disregard it. You problematize that knowledge. Um, a few things about what Frary did not say, my pet peeve. Frary did not say that education is non-directive. So a lot of people think if you're Frarian, and this is this is actually really my pet peeve. People come into the classroom and say, I'm Frarian. What are we going to talk about today, everyone? Let me know. First of all, it's my pet peeve because it's a pretty lazy way to be a teacher. And second, it's my pet peeve because Frary never, Frary never thought teachers and students were equal, right? Frary thinks that teachers have more knowledge, they have a, a sense of where they want to go with the educational process, and they have to lead students in that direction. They can't just allow conversation to flow, they have to be intentional with how they're constructing dialogue. And so it takes a lot of work to be Freire in, in my mind. And Freire wasn't against lecturing either. Freire would give lectures and he thought that lecturing has, has its place in time. It's not like everything is just dialogue and games. Um, the step six one is humility. So Freire critiques a lot secretarianism. Do people know that word, secretarianism? is basically either on the left or the right, and you have an idea of how the world should be, and you're just like trying to get people to get to that end point, that for him is secretarianism. And for Sec secretarianism. What did I say? Secretarianism. <laughs> it's not about secretary. Secretarianism. Sec secretarianism. Sectarianism. 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 Sorry. It's my Jersey accent. <laughs> um, I don't think you can play with that Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the point is, is that, and I actually like this too, because he really critiques left-leaning revolutionaries for just assuming what the world should look like. And he said, we all have to have humility to know the world isn't how we want it to be, but we don't know what it should look like, and we just have to move forward together with this humility about the future. 
And then finally, this idea of technique versus practice. Freire always said that he was not producing a technique. It's not as though you can go to a classroom, do some problem posing, do some games, and then you're Freire. And in fact, it's famous that the CIA, the CIA, once ordered 2,000 copies of a book called Particip Participatory Techniques for Popular Education. Why did the CIA do this? Why did CIA do this? Because varying techniques are pretty effective in teaching learning, right? And so many different people can use this techniques, but to be frarian, it's about this larger political, uh, this larger educational approach to thinking about the role of education in social change. And so um, the techniques he described, picture codification, group skits, theater, participatory activities, um, that's not frarian. Those aren't using those techniques to frarian. It's about the whole entire approach, right? Um, and just real quick, where does Freire live today? I mean, I think, I was trying to actually find the picture. Um, this is, this is uh, Martin and David in an MSC settlement. This is the Ministry of Education. This is a, another school in Brazil. This is Rosa Parks, who uh, went to the Highlander Center, which was an educational institute in the South before she started Montgomery Boycott. This is a description of the Tucson student district, uh, Tucson school district that just outlawed Freire. This is an example of labor unions who use Freire through this spiral activity. Anyway, so the point is Freire lives in very various places. Even though he's dead, Freire lives in various places. And so that's really why I consider myself uh, a, a Freirean, interested in Freirean theory, because I'm interested in how people are reinventing him now in the contemporary moment and, and what those pedagogies look like. So, Okay. You don't fight a lot at schools. What? Fight a lot at schools. Freire let you put a picture of Paulo there. Freire, yeah. Paulo, Paulo has a famous article about Freire and how fab labs are a way to like, uh, what's it called? The Trojan horse? Yeah, the Trojan horse. Oh, travels and trouble with Freire. Like, yeah, fab labs called? can bring Freire into the classroom secretly. So anyway, he lives everywhere. Okay. And he lives, uh, Martin, Car Martin has a, uh, in that Pedagogy of the Heart, has an intro to Freire's last book he wrote. So, so, it's everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will comment very quickly so we can open for discussion. Basically, uh, we, are, we are talking about Paul Fig's idea almost 50 years after he wrote this book, Pedagogy of the Press, and we're coming back to this, the source where everything begins. Um, and I think this means two things, uh, that his ideas are still alive, either you agree or not with it, uh, and that his ideas are universal, because he, we are here at Stanford and we are discussing his, and his contemporary here also, his ideas. Um, and I, by going to classes at Stanford, we observe how much poetry is alive here in the curriculum of this university, in the School of Education. Uh, I'm taking a mathematics instruction and curriculum class, and we read Gutstein, which is a critical pedagogue, or he uses critical pedagogy to frame his work as a professor, researcher, and a teacher. And he talks about Freudian ideas and the relationship of race in the US, etc. Dennis Popper, which is a very famous professor here, for curriculum construction has Freire in her readings. Um, and he's also very much alive in Brazil. Pope. Denise Pope. 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 Okay. Uh, she's, and, and he's uh, very much alive in Brazil right now. Um, unfortunately, uh, not <laughs> for the very same reasons. He's, he's famous here. This is a picture of uh, the protests that happened last year for the impeachment of the president. Um, and it was really surprising for Freudians and for people who understand these ideas that uh, that this, uh, people were holding the sign. Chega de doutrinação marxista, basta de Paulo And this association that his ideas have with the left in Brazil and the um, um, his, his ideas are perceived 
as responsible for educational problems in Brazil that are associated to the left. Um, in any case, for good reasons or bad reasons, uh, I would argue that the, these ideas are powerful ideas, uh, helped shape education in Brazil. Uh, and if had not, we wouldn't have seen this last year, uh, and helped shape education uh, in the world this whole body of knowledge known as critical pedagogy that has, um, in the, is this the correct name, critical pedagogy, that in the US developed and lots of scholars are, to, are related to this work um, and that justify studying him. Uh, the question that I would like to discuss with you is how do we apply his ideas? If his ideas, if his ideas are relevant ideas, and they are contemporary ideas, are important ideas, how do we apply his ideas nowadays to teaching and to research? Okay. Um, so the first, I would like to the first question that I would like we, we, to debate is how would research in education look like in a Freirean perspective? Uh, Thinking, like I, I got a quote from the back of the press where he's saying about uh, in order to make social social change, that is to achieve the goal of social, social change, the oppressed must confront reality critically, simultaneously objectifying and acting upon the reality. So a mere perception of the reality not followed by this critical intervention will not lead to transformation of the objective reality precisely because it's not a true perception. So how would we discuss research? Thinking about last week's debate, where Rebecca was uh, uh, debating in a way with uh, Hanushek about the importance of context, and I think David's point about his work was also related to the fact that it's kind of decontextualized, and in his opinion, this is okay. So how would we place ourselves as researchers in this, in this idea? So then we can go to teaching. So, so I think both Paula and Zayla and she wanted us to discuss, uh, because she thought that the one thing we all have in common is that we're all researchers. And so she thought it would be interesting to discuss what research would look like from a current perspective. So I think it would be interesting to talk about this question. And if there's also clarification questions about Ferrari in general and other thoughts. We can just open it up in general. Um, does that sound good? Do we need to talk in pairs first to, to dr bring out dialogue? We're small. No, no, no. I, I, said, I was just saying we're small enough. We don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I will, uh, not to answer, but to put more uh, words in the discussion for your first question. There is how we can think about how Freddy today in, in the Brazilian education and also in world education. Because uh, I, I write here when Rebecca told us that Paulo Freire is related with constructivism in Brazil. And also that Paulo Freire, the Freirean method is uh, understanding sometimes that ah, you can just arrive in the classroom and talk with students about anything and it's okay. And I think we have a really bad perception about what is free uh, intellectual construction in Brazil. Because people talk a lot about Paul Freire, but didn't read Paul Freire, actually. Because if people read, never will think about this. Pedagogy of autonomy, mm -hmm. he said this, that professor is the authority, but not authoritarian person yeah. in the classroom. So I think uh, the first thing is, is kind of disconstruct this, this image that Paulo Freire has in Brazil, that he is against uh, an organized class, that he's against the content also, because this is kind of perception we have that, that you, you will only talk about the student reality. And one of the problems is that, for example, if a student lives, lives in Iceland, we only talk about Islam. This is what happened in schools. I, I see this work in Islam. You only talk about that, and you, and you don't talk about the world with the student. That's the perception. So I think, first of all, is to understand how deep we can go in the knowledge 
of the work, with uh, the systematic knowledge, uh, to to expand the, the students' thinking. You know, and I think this is the most powerful uh, idea now in the discussion of the the curriculum in Brazil that we can bring. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning that quote. That's a great quote about from Ferrari about the teacher is the authority but not authoritarian. Yeah. Yes. And he constructs his authority with knowledge. Mm -hmm. He's the authority of knowledge, he talked. And, and there is another text from Pedro Demo when he discusses his idea. Can, can I? Okay. I mean, like, I've seen about Sean Reardon's work on inequality. And I was just trying to, I mean, I, I, I always go back to, I don't know if you remember when he presented, had like that SIBA supper. Mm -hmm. And everybody was asking these very soft questions to him. Uh, most of them is very sympathetic to his. And you ask him a very simple question, what's the action item here? And, uh, and, and so, so Sean Reardon, for those of you who don't know his work well, he's, he's done a really careful job of documenting uh, the growth of inequality in the United States. And, and part of his uh, hypothesis is that uh, starting around 1970 or so, uh, richer families, for whatever reason, started to invest more heavily um, in their children's education, especially over the summer. Well, he, uh, he doesn't know whether it's starting in the 70s. He just has days. Yes. Yeah. Well, so they probably was, always did. But he's making the claim that there's more aggressive but investments that are somehow yeah. Yeah, yeah. converting, you know, whereas before it might have been a trip. Now it's an educational experience right. that somehow pushes a child towards additional academic achievement. But you know, he presented this, and he documented it, and he showed that it existed. And then after he did this, you know, everyone was asking questions just about the phenomenon. And, Martin asked some questions, so what do we do about this? And, and it, it, the, all the air went out of the sail in some sense because he, he, didn't, he hadn't really thought about it. And it seems, strikes me as a nice example in some sense of thinking about this particular question. I mean, so is it the researcher's obligation to demonstrate the phenomenon, which is what Sean's done, or is it the researcher's obligation to lead that dialogue around it into some type of action-oriented item? And I, I mean, in some sense, I'm putting it out there for those of you who understand Any better. Other, I think Freire would say the second is what makes a research a Freire research, and other people would say you lose objectivity when you do this. Exactly. Yeah, I, it, it's an interesting point. I want to make one point, and that is, that I find the sign that you posted very interesting because it really shows that this is terribly unfair. Because first of all, Freire didn't did not come out from a Marxist view. You could argue that liberation theology was in some sense influenced by Marxism, but I think more important, it goes back to the fundamentals of Catholicism. I wouldn't say Christianity, but Catholicism, because um, he believed, like many Catholics do, uh, and not only Catholics, but Mormons, etc., that you got to, in some sense, you got to help the poor. Just what uh, uh, Rebecca started out with, that it isn't, it's by chance. I mean, what did the Jesus say? It's by chance that these people are poor. It isn't that they did something to be poor. And so there's a fundamental thing in Catholicism which very engaged himself with from the very beginning was influenced by, and that is, that our job as Catholics is to help the poor. And so I think what they added was, you know, don't give them fish, teach them how to fish. And the, he saw that the, the, the illiteracy was an incredible barrier to people's self-consciousness uh, and self-perception. and. When I, I happened, uh, I knew that he was going to Nicaragua in 1983 after the Sun and Easter Revolution. So I, so I planned a trip so that I would overlap with him in Nicaragua. I went for two weeks, and I said, the ferry was there for two weeks, and I stayed with him the whole time. And we went around to these different literacy programs that they had started. And I saw them actually doing his method. And I saw people at the, the oh, people in their 50s, uh, uh, peasants, who, who were writing, who were learning how to spell words on the board, 
and the looks on their faces as they were able actually to spell words, the looks that they actually succeeded at this was beyond anything you can imagine. I mean, it was liberation. It was a liberation from the kind of oppression, I don't know if you know anybody who's illiterate or, or, or bad at something that you're not supposed to be bad at, and hides it and hides it and hides it. It's a terrible world. I've heard interviews here in the United States with people who are illiterate, and they just hide it. They somehow will go around it and stuff, and they will not admit it. It's like, it's a terrible thing. So I think the action part uh, in research I mean, I asked Sean a somewhat unfair question, but uh, because because perfectly fair. No, no, but because because I think the main thing is uh, Sean. I know Sean is dedicated to trying to uncover inequality. I mean, all his work is about that. All his work is about that. So Hanushek, you could argue is more concerned about efficiency. I mean, that's different from trying to uncover inequality. If someone's willing to fly to Connecticut to testify that they're spending too much money on education, I consider that an action. Sean does not do that. Yeah. It's a difference of purpose. I know what you do in your spare time, little that you have. That's different than what other people are doing. He's not just an intellectual, for example. He's really out there, really trying to help people that with whatever time he has, and uh, who don't have. And I think that that's what Freire's talking about. Freire's talking about, it's not coming out of Marxism. It's, yes, the people are oppressed. That's true. But in a sense, Catholics also say that people are oppressed, you know? We throw the money lenders out of the temple. Right? What is the difference between that and what Sanders is saying? Throw the money lenders out of the temple, he's saying. <clears throat> now, I don't think it's so easy to throw the money lenders out of the temple, but at the same time, the idea of doing research that really not only focuses on, on things that are, you can choose what you want to, what you want to uh, uh, research. Uh, it's a hard line to say, if you don't take action, you're not really, you're not really doing enough. I, I'm willing to go short of that. If your intention is to try to honestly uncover sources of inequality that may help others to organize around these things, I think that's pretty good. I mean, it would be good if Sean could tell us what's the next step. You know, now that I've discovered this, uh, what do we do? Uh, I think your point's fair. It's, it's basically saying, Sean might have the intent, he might have the ideas on how to fix that. Yeah, but he and, would like to. But he realizes good. his strength is in actually bringing it up and keeping it in the actual forefront of the discussion. I, I would have hope for more people. I would have answered it simply. I would have said, we've got to duplicate for everybody what the rich are doing for their kids. You know. We've got to build more preschools. You know, we've got to make free preschool. We've got to identify summer opportunities, lots of summer opportunities, be willing to spend the money for these low-income kids so that they basically have what the thing. Or the kind of information that you're concerned about this, they've got to have the same information as everybody else. And that's an action item. Somebody's got to do that. So I think that's the Frarian idea. What he identified so well, I'll finish with this, is that to engage adults, I don't know how well it works with kids, but at least to engage adults out there, they're very aware of their surroundings. They suppress that awareness. They, they want to suppress because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be an activist if you're poor because you can easily be crushed because the power relationships are so unequal. But what he helped them to do was at least in a, in a safe space, in a, in a literacy program, to be able to come to awareness in that safe space, and through that awareness, to overcome this huge barrier of oppression, which keeps people, the fact that they can't read is just a symbol of their powerlessness. And 
And when he, they figured that out, it didn't work so well with kids. It didn't work so well with kids because of, of what you said, Rebecca. It's very hard to be a prairian, constructivist teacher. You have to be tremendously political aware. You have to know how to use the kids' current situation, which means you have to be really aware of it and engage with it and get them also to learn difficult content, content which is difficult for them at the same time. So it's not just saying, oh, we're going to teach you to read. OK, we're going to teach you to read. Now we're going to make you a good reader. We're going to make you interested in books which you don't have. And we're going to make you do good mathematics. So you've got to know a lot of math to be able to do that. How do you engage kids in learning to do mathematics with your poor kids who do not have enough to eat, et cetera, et cetera? It's hard work. So you have to be a superstar to be able to do that. Bradley was a superstar, and he was able to do it with adults, but it's much harder to do it with kids. Um, I just want to make a point, coming back to what Rebecca said about a man of its time, because I think he became less radical in the, in the sense as he grew older and as times changed. Uh, but I would argue that in this book, he would make a difference. Which is that one? The Pedagogy of the Press. Okay. He would make a difference uh, about a researcher that has this action and the other one that just reveals reality. But I think he would he would agree with what we are saying here. Uh, that is a matter of agenda for myself. I, can, I come from a completely different world where this kind of discussions is every day yeah, it's common in every day, it's the utilitarianism of science or not, so I come from physics and there's always this discussion, should we spend thousands and millions of dollars in researching, you know, uh, the black holes or, you know, <laughs> different... Uh, or another particle. Oh, yeah, particle. Or, so why don't we spend really problems that we, you know, we really have to face, like uh, uh, cancer, uh, cure or whatever, it's everyday life, but the, 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 this tension is always uh, important and I, I, I would say that both parts are, are complementary and uh, if we move the perspective of this basic aspect of science or uh, research, uh, we can be losing a lot of things that cannot show up in the practical you know, point of view. It's a, there's a fun story, a very old one, when uh, there was uh, Michael Faraday in the, uh, it's a very well-known physicist in, that discovered the, the, the basic principles of electricity. He was giving a lecture at the, at the Royal Society. He came from a very poor family, by the way. Yeah, yeah, he came right, and he was presenting this uh, lecture in the Royal Society. He was discovering just now, he, he was approaching a, a magnet in a circuit, and the, he realized that the, the current of the circuit uh, changed when he approached the, the magnet. And he made a fantastic speech there, and someone asked, okay, Dr. Uh, Mr. Farley, excellent talk, beautiful experiment, but what, what, why, why this is important? Uh, what do you see uh, here as an application of this problem? And he was thinking, well, why, which is the utility of a baby? <laughs> What's the utility of a baby? No, no, no utility at all. <laughs> but I, I, indeed, it, what happened that after that is that this is the basic principle of a motor that, of course, you know, transformer and everything that happened in the uh, revol uh, industry revolution, it's due to that. And uh, it's, uh, it's that baby that was born without any utility, utility at all. So this is. This is a point. The same happened in the quantum mechanics and the beginning of 20th century that uh, ended up to computers and everything that we have. So, this I know that in social sciences this is a little bit different, but it's a part of the game. I would say that the, to find this equilibrium in, in, in utilitary and practical work and the basic research is really important. So this is my. No, I'm just going to make a kind of a joke that now his work is 50 years old, so maybe he's going to start having an effect in reality. Yeah. <laughs> the baby has grown. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bob, if you want to get on Stack, I'll like, just wait to see. Bob. Me? Yeah. 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 Oh, well, I figure in every group you have to have kind of a, a cynic, you know, someone <laughs> that raises questions that, you know, other people 
necessarily great. You're not, you're not, you're not, think, good, you're not good at this role. I think Paul <laughs> Curry would like that. I think he'd like that. So Pro he'd like that. It's about accent right now. A problematizer, not a yeah, cynic. He'd like to <laughs> have a debate and people, you know, different opinions. And so let me put out a couple of thoughts for the group to think about. One, I had the same problem that you had in the sense of reading his book. I read it in the early 1970s, uh, I think it was 1971 when it first came out. And it was very hard to read. I don't know if anybody else has any very problem hard reading Paul Freire. Maybe in Portuguese, I'm not sure. Maybe it's no, easier it's to read in no. Portuguese. But I mean, <laughs> here's a person who's trying to communicate and get across ideas and change, you know, change people's thinking and that sort of thing. And maybe he's you know, affected doing that in terms of adult education, but in terms of me as an adult, reading this work is very hard to simulate it. And, you, know, uh, you people have obviously been very affected at taking out the essence and you know, synthesizing the essence, but to sit down and read Paul Ferry is very difficult to do. So I always wonder about that. I mean, how come he didn't make more of an effort to write in a way that we could assimilate more easily his ideas, considering his ideas are so important? A second issue is, I really don't know, and I think maybe somebody more most likely knows, but I have never seen a rigorous study of the power for that in terms of its effects on learning and you know, that sort of thing. Uh, have you run across, I mean, you know, there was a, Are you talking about an adult issue? Yeah, and any, where, where you're using control groups and, you know, kind of in, you know, where, where you could call it rigorous research. You know, where you're actually uh, not just observing and saying, well, you know, but you're actually comparing with with another way with it. another uh, methodology and whether this is really the best uh, and whether or not there's any follow-up in terms of the long-term effects and that sort of thing, impact effects. I don't know. I've never seen that. So when we talk about research, I wonder if we shouldn't do more research really on Colin Prairie because I don't think I think there's kind of a sense that everything he says is correct and it's obviously inspirational. But I don't know if it's really been subjected to rigorous research. But you know, there's an interesting thing because if he, before he came up with all of this, he uh, the Cubans had already in 1961 did a mobilization. Of nine months, I think, where they took 250,000 people and sent them into the countryside, uh, students, etc., uh, to teach. Uh, a much smaller percentage of Cubans uh, than Brazilians who were illiterate. And they went out and they did this big literacy campaign. And that, that occurred before. One of the pedagogy of press was published seven years after the literacy campaign. Oh, right. So there was this huge literacy campaign that had occurred. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it had a tremendous impact in terms of its, it was known worldwide. It was a big deal. They also, they also during that literacy campaign, said no one can study. No, everyone who was in high school had to stop going to high school for two years and had to go out and be part of it. So they like stopped all Cuban a education. Year, for, one year. One oh, sorry. Year. They stopped all Cuban education for a year. So right. They said no one deserves to learn if people are illiterate, and they went out. Uh, sure. It was one of the things. Yeah. Going back to your C point. Well, that's good. Well, I don't know. I mean, to me, that that that's not what the kind of research I'm talking about. Can I have uh, uh, one point on the research? Yeah. One, one thing that was a comment that I was going to make was, I wonder, given the data sets that are available, I wonder if there's a way to track some of the individuals that, yeah. from the street, like, the, and look at the intergenerational issues, uh -huh. right? Because in some sense, right, if we can show that there's these kind of intergenerational issues associated with kind of empowering adult literacy, uh, that it, it really does improve the outcomes of the children relative to what they would have been, uh -huh. that'd be actually kind of a really nice... I don't what? think he was interested in this aspect of literacy. The thing about measuring is that his method, mm -hmm. if we can call a method, was more interested in the political outcome mm -hmm. of consciousness versus how you decodify words. And so depending on the instrument you're going to, like how you compare a method that is more we're concerned about fluency, spelling, correctness, with a, something that is more concerned about the political but awareness. More because of the time he did this. But he saw about something yeah. else. What well, effect does that have on the kids of these people? Yeah. The kids of the parents who, yeah. who were, I who mean, were in the sure. sure. 
Yeah, but the, yeah. And I think Bob had one last third oh, yeah. point. No, just, just, that. That. When I first started my graduate study, my big idea was to do a vertical study in California. Then I went into my graduate advisor and he said, no, we can do this. Operationalize it, just as you were saying. Operationalize it so different. And he said, you know, do that some of the time, but don't try to do that dissertation. Uh, but the third point is I've worked for many years in the School of Education in Brazil. And it seems to me that Paulo Freire is much bigger outside of Brazil than inside of Brazil. Whenever you go outside of Brazil, whenever you go to international conferences, it's always a big topic. In Brazil, I think it tends to not be much of a topic. In fact, if you go to a big academic meeting like convention, I think you'll run across the names like Piaget, and you'll run across even Gramsci, and you'll run across other names with, <laughs> with much more frequency then you run across uh, the name Paul Furry, which is the day. And I see basically uh, three issues that may explain this. I don't know if this is true or not. But first of all, there really isn't much of a concern, especially with the schools of education, with what we call adult education or adult literacy education. I mean, the concern is really with basic education, and especially the early years of basic education. And so I think that kind of diminishes perhaps the relative importance of public uh, because the discussion is no longer really about adult literacy. The second factor, I think, is this concern not only with basic education, but with the idea of massification. In other words, can you mass, what's the word, mass, massify uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, this technique? I mean, it, it, it works in small groups, and it works with limited uh, populations, but can you apply this in a universal way to uh, all children and all people that are uh, going through the learning process. And of course, that's what you want uh, if you're fighting for better education for yourself. And the third thing is, I think, uh, in the academic community, Jeremy Bell Saviani had a real impact in terms of turning the tendency against Bob uh, Because his whole argument, and of course, he was not only very big, probably the biggest person in education in Brazil. It's like a Marxist educational theorist from Rio yeah. de Janeiro, but, Federal but University. Saviani? Yeah, Saviani. Yeah. Saviani. Saviani. And you have to remember. He's also doing it kind Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's right. right. That's right. That's right. He, he's, and, 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 and he's also the, the graduate advisor of the biggest people in education in Brazil. You know, we just had yeah, and what was his? Gilmar the other day. She he has like a Marxist history. Gilmar was. He's a really interesting So, Gilmar was her student. So, what is, what would he look like? Hold, hold on a second. Yeah, I was just going to finish it. So, well, what Saviani's big, big attack was that Furry didn't give enough attention to learning contents. He gave to knowledge, to cognitive aspects, to uh, learning about, you know, really. Uh, dealing with uh, information and knowledge and so on and so forth. You know, he was really just, he was mainly interested in terms of the political uh, concepts, but not so much in learning, uh, you know, uh, content uh, knowledge. And so this, I think, really had an impact in the academic community in terms of reducing the importance, the relevant importance of Paul Ferry and emphasizing uh, other people that emphasize learning, reading, writing, arithmetic, as opposed to political uh, orientation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say quickly say, just time out, because we are, we're at the end of what our time is. I'm happy to have the discussion keep on going, but I wanna acknowledge that if people have classes, you know, totally free to go. And then before people go, is there any last words that you wanna? Yeah, so I think Basil wants to say words. something. No, can, we, can we, just one more person? Yeah. Okay. One more person, and then I have some last words. Sure. No, authoritarian. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I wanna no, it's just, just, <laughs> I'm not going to make any things, but I just want to comment with Professor uh, Verheim that he, uh, being uh, in, uh, in the education school of the Federal University of Pernambuco, who is likely one of the places that you would expect the most influence of Ferry to be, people read Ferry, but by far Savian is the biggest influence in uh, this critical content pedagogy that, how they say it, that like, if you want to really emancipate these, these kids, you have to teach them what the world expects them to learn, but from a critical standpoint, and not like these abstract political ideas, and that you really have to prepare them to get into the world and, and act. And, uh, and this, this is definitely what's on, going on there in the school of education.
way more savvy than you. All right, I have a few final thoughts, and then Paula can have a final final if she wants. But just um, first of all, thank you all for the serious discussion. I think the the it's. All I want in life is for people to have serious discussions about Frary and Frarian theory and the idea of education as a generator of social change um, and like really what that means. So I think this was a great conversation. I have just a few points I want to make about different things people said. Um, I think it's interesting this question of is Paulo Freire hard to read? I found him hard to read as a middle class woman in my 20s who was an activist. That being said, it's infamous in the 70s that people would make photocopies. It was The book was banned all around the world, and people would make photocopies. Illiterate people who were super poor, and they'd actually like read the book to each other in corners of Africa and Asia and Brazil and, and the United States. So um, the question is, like, is it hard to read? Is it hard to read for people who are poor, and that maybe he speaks to certain experiences more than others? And so this question of whether you have to take theory out to make something easier to read. I think, I think, it's, a, I think it's a question that we can all think about. Um, in terms of studies that have been done on Freire, uh, A, yes, there's a lot of studies, a lot of qualitative studies. Leslie Bartlett has a really good study looking at three different Freire and educational models in Brazil. It's a whole book called Reading the Word in the World. Um, Robert Arnoff has a big study of the uh, Nicaragua Sandinistas and their use of Freire. A lot of these studies are more qualitative. I would put out that if you're in a school of education getting a PhD, you could ruin your career by, stud by studying adult education in the United States. Like basically adult education ruins your career. And if you're an economist, even worse. And so the idea, like I think it would be great to have all these studies, but we'd really have to change the priorities in schools of education in the US. Um, in terms of the Saviana question, I think it's so interesting because the, uh, the landless workers movement, so you all know that I study the landless workers movement because I really want to know, is it possible to take Frarian popular educational experiences and put them in the formal school system? I want to know, is that possible? Can we take Frary and make it into the formal school system? Paul Frary himself certain, certain, certainly did, didn't do it, but can the Landless Workers Movement did it, do it? And Frary, and sorry, the MST, the Landless Workers Movement, gets critiqued by Saviani and all of Saviani's graduate students for using Frary. Basically, they're like, why are you using Freire? Like, our Marxist historical dialectical method is so much more powerful. Like, why are you doing this? And the, the MST's response, first of all, you have to remember that the MST came out of, out of very poor peasant populations who had a connection to the Catholic Church and liberation theology who were you practicing Freire. And so the MST's response is always, Saviani's theories don't have a material reality. Like they don't exist in classrooms and in, in, in experiences on the ground. And so for the MST, they're like, yeah, we like what Saviani says, we, we read him. But Freire actually has a, a method and a practice that was developed around the world and we're gonna respect those movements and those groups that have actually implemented that practice. And so they, they always get critiqued by these Saviani people and they just push back and say, we're not gonna let go of Freire, we're not because he's so important to grassroots movements. That being said, when the MST went to take their Frarian educational model and implement it in the school system, they were they didn't know what to do. They were like, Frary, Frary talked about classroom pedagogy, but Frary didn't discuss how to transform the relationships between principals and teachers and students and communities and look at structures. Like Frary didn't talk about how you transform structures. And so the MST really had to look towards other social theorists to understand how to tra transform school systems. And so I think Freire probably isn't enough for a public school system. And finally, I just, on this discussion about action and research, I think you're absolutely correct, Martin. I think that Freire wouldn't critique um, Sean because if Sean's intellectual project is studying inequality, like that's really important. And it's not, it's not mechanical, I need to have an action item for every research. And even that might be disempowering if you have an action item, but don't let people who are actually in poverty come up with solutions. That not, that's not fair in either. So I think the question is really what, what and this is what I asked Eduardo the other day about his uh, tech, uh, his uh, innovation. Like innovation for what? Research for what? Like why are we all doing this? Why are we involved? And I think as long as we're involved to try to transform the world in a positive direction, like that's a Freirean research project. So yeah. that's my, yeah, my last statement. Yeah, my very last comment is that I think 
how the failure resonates more among the teachers than maybe we think by looking at scholars at school of education. Mm -hmm. If you work with teachers at the school level, and I'm not saying this is necessarily positive, what they do with that because they haven't discussed deeply, as Barbara said. So I think it's really relevant, mm -hmm. even though I agree with you that scholars, some scholars put, put down this work, but I think it really resonates among teachers. When you talk to teachers, they they talk about his ideas. It, it not necessarily in a good way, but they do. Okay. In, in terms of our uh, schedule, so next week we'll send out uh, some readings to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, Bob will actually uh, wind up uh, taking us through, and then David Plank will be on the 16th, Martin will be on the 23rd, and then we'll do the affirmative action on the 1st. Um, in the first week of, of the we, we had talked about doing another week, and it'd be worthwhile to kind of uh, work with Paulo to kind of get that on the schedule, because we're going to come back and actually have another, at least one, maybe a couple of weeks in the spring where we come back to Prairie, and so, you know, we look forward to having more discussion there. This was a terrific conversation, yeah. and thank you very much.